All right, so this is the laser. Okay, so this is a very unusual title for a talk, right? Physics of Society. And uh, this is the outline of this talk. Is, uh, I will show you that this is uh, more than a scientific field, it's a very old uh, dream of many people, not necessarily scientists, also political philosophers, writers, and uh, starting from the sixth, say, 17th century already. And only now, with the computational facilities, with the know-how of statistical physics, and uh, with the availability of massive data concerning social dynamics, large-scale social dynamics, it is possible to fulfill this dream. So this is the structure that I gave to this talk. There will be a brief prologue, which includes some historical um, hints about what happened in the past, about social physics. And then I will tell you what social physics is, and then I will highlight uh, a big success of this, which gives us behavior, can really be successful, and let us know better society and social dynamics. So of course we know, you know, elementary physics, atoms, simple objects, not really so simple, but let's say simple objects, elementary objects with few basic features, charge, mass, then if you want to go inside you can also have, you know, color charge and so on, but this is some sort of general framework. And uh, they interact with few basic forces like uh, the gravitational interaction, electromagnetic and the nuclear interaction force, uh, strong and weak. Then it's out of this interaction that you can explain basically all the existing phenomenology, everything concerning matter, from the microscopic level of atoms, you know, very small world, until gal the motion of galaxies and universe. But then, what some people, some smart people, long ago ask is, can the individual be considered as a social atom? Can we reduce his uh, individual complexity um, to the level of few basic properties that can explain simply what happens when a big bunch of people, like in this case, act together. So this is a very old idea, of course, but uh, as nice as it is, it collides against a number of problems. Individuals are not atoms, so they are complex, you know, because each individual has its own psychology, its own education, its own personal history and background. On top of that, Social experiments are not exactly reproducible. It's not like you make you know, a ball fall from many different places and you find that it takes the same time if you drop it from the same height to, for, the, for the object to touch the ground. So it's not really like this. However, this is an ancient dream, like I say, by a number of people, like this one, Thomas Hobbes, famous philosopher, 17th century, Marquis of Condorcet, William Petty, uh, August Conte. This is the guy who invented the word sociology, by the way and the Ketele was an astronomer. These are people that mostly, at least these four, um, were so amazed by the successes of Newtonian mechanics who could explain and predict so precisely the position of you know, when a comet will come next time, you know, when you will have the next eclipses, and so on, that, uh, that they say, why can't we do the same thing in society? Why can't we be as precise as the, you know, accurate in predicting social behavior, large-scale social behavior. So, and about what they had in mind, you can watch this. These are some citations from, uh, some quotes from what they said. This is Comte, one of the guys you see in the previous pictures. Now that the human mind has grasped celestial and terrestrial physics, mechanical and chemical, organic physics, both vegetable and animal, there remains one science to fill up the series of sciences of observation, social physics. This is what men have now most need of. And this is the principal aim, uh, and this it is the principal aim of the present work to establish. System of positive philosophy, 18, uh, 19th century, so 1830, 1842. So you see social physics comes with a very long history behind it. It's not our invention. And John Stuart Mill, slightly later, wrote ve the very events. He was interested in the very events which in their own nature appear most capricious and uncertain, like human behavior and which in any individual case no attainable degree of knowledge would enable us to foresee, occur when considerable numbers are taken into account with a degree of regularity approaching to mathematical. So, in a sense, they were formulating the question and they were partly giving the, the answer. So, there is hope that this thing can be really attainable if you consider large number. If you don't consider just small groups of people, if you consider large populations of people. Of course, they didn't have exactly in, you know, in mind how to address this problem, but what they knew already at that time that there were a number of social statistics which were very regular across countries in many years. 
number of people dying or you know, um, being born in the same country, number of suicides, number of dead letters, all these things were kind of stable. And the distributions were, you know, if you consider different samples of the population, were uh, very well described by the very precise law, which was the Gaussian law. So they were amazed by this. So they say, see, these are very different people. There are many, many reasons why a family decides to have kids or somebody dies. It can be a illness, it can be an accident, and so on. But still, these numbers are constant. So maybe if you put things together, if you consider a large amount, uh, sorry, large population, a large bunch of people, something simple can happen, and all these details do not matter. And this is where we, think, uh, we can take over. This is actually a solution, a statistical approach, at least a tentative solution. Considering many things, like the atoms of a gas, and considering people as if they were the atoms of a gas, and studying their collective properties. The collective properties of uh, society, of large social groups, can be possibly, hopefully, described in a simple way by uh, picturing the individuals with a few basic properties and their interaction just very, at a very basic level. So then we're not interested, we are not interested in predicting what he would think in half an hour. Of course, we're not, we're not magicians, right? We're still scientists. Um, but what we can predict is what an average property, an average number, or a distribution, a statistical distribution, would look like or where it comes from. This is what we can hope to do. And we have uh, serious reasons to believe that this is possible because of the stunning successes of statistical physics, especially starting from the 70s, when the theory of phase transition came along and when the concept of universality was established. So this is, uh, you know, very famous, sorry, very famous phase transitions, liquid gas. You now if you boil the water at some point, if you give enough heat to the water, then you turn it to the uh, gas state from a liquid state and vice versa if you stay, you reduce the heat. And in the other case, instead, you take a piece of iron and also in this case you increase the temperature or decrease the temperature of the system. If you increase the temperature, it loses the ferromagnetic property that makes it act as a magnet, attracting other metals, and it becomes paramagnetic. So these two systems, which look so different, these two phenomena, can be described in a very same way with very few, uh, you know, very, very basic uh, uh, properties, and they have very basic features like the so-called critical exponents, that have the, same, the very same explanation behind it. So this is well known. This actually took the Nobel Prize discovery for the renormalization group to Kenneth Wilson, who was also a particle physicist. So this is the main message. This is what uh, uh, grounds our hopes that this thing is really possible also for society. The concept of universality, details do not matter. The very basic level, collective properties can be the same, can be described in the same way, whether it's water or iron, whether it's magnetism or uh, the change of phase of matter. So this is true for matter. Can it be true for society? This is our challenge. It's a challenge that's been addressed already in the last few years, trying to give a follow-up to what uh, these big guys that I showed you before had in mind, of course, in a very naive way. It was a different time, different knowledge, different type of expertise and knowledge. So what is sociophysics then? It's an analysis and modeling of large-scale social phenomena with the methods of statistical physics. Large-scale social phenomena, many people at the same time collective properties emerging from local interactions between individuals, for which you don't know, you need to know how tall a guy is, you know, or what's the color of his hair. So you just need to know, you know something else, depending, of course, on what the property that you want, the collective property that you are interested in uh, uh, is about. So you have to go from local interactions to global order. You see the global order, and you may wonder what is the microscopic mechanism which is behind this. And this is why, uh, in order to study these things, you have to consider large ensembles of uh, objects. Not necessarily people, animals here. This is flocking, these are birds. You see you know, how regularly they form these waves. I'm going to show you an, an, an animation, a small movie about this. How simply you can describe this with a mathematical model. Or, these are people now, this is the pilgrimage around the Kaaba stone in uh, uh, La Mecca, you know, this Muslim pilgrimage, they, go, they went, actually, they don't do this anymore. Um, they went around the Kaaba stone, but there were every year many accidents because, you know, it was very hot, it can be 40 degrees plus, not minus like you can have here. Um, so when you, you can have, I think many bad things can happen also minus 40. Yes. <laughs> but when it's plus 40 and there are so many people, people can faint and then people can step over you and then can start some sort of stampede and many people can die. And every year there were 
tens of people dying during this very phenomenon, which is, as you know, is a kind of a must for each good Muslim. They must do this at least once. They should do it. It's advisable to do it at least once in a lifetime. And of course, dangerous situations do not need to happen in La Mecca when it's so, so hot outside. They can also happen in stadium. You know, there was a big slaughter kind of two years ago in Duisburg. There were just people going there peacefully for a festival, and then there was a panic situation, and then, you know, in these cases, you can hardly have control. If you don't have uh, good safety measures, like in this case, you have a narrow access, people can just squash each other, and some people can get killed. So these things can be predicted, actually, with a standing degree of success, and that's the reason why I'm bringing you this example. Even if we want to go beyond this, we would like to study other types of social dynamics, not just collective emotion. Examples of simple mathematical models, like the one I'm going to show you to close, um, that uh, can explain this, can explain how people can clap in face at the concert, even if there is nobody saying, you should clap now, and then now, and then now. Because just people, people try to orient and synchronize their clapping with the ones that they hear, with the intensity of the sound that they hear. So it's a spontaneous uh, phenomenon order. So let me see. So flocking can be, so you see how simple sometimes physics can be. You know? So this is a bird. And this is what the bird is for me. So just uh, an arrow indicating which direction it's moving. And the length of the arrow is telling you how fast it's moving. OK? It's a little naive, right? I'm forgetting a number of things. There are no feathers. There is no, no mouse. There are no eyes. There are no wings. There is nothing. But the important thing is the concepts. When they make this flocking, thousands of animals moving in the same direction, of course, in a more or less regular way, there is nobody, like it can be from buffalo or something, nobody who says, you have to go this direction, follow me. For birds, it's not like this. They don't have really a big perception about what's happening very far from them. They just can check what happens to their neighbors. And they try to move like their neighbors, in the same direction, more or less at the same speed. So you can model a flock in this very elementary way. Take this uh, red, this is, would be our reference bird. What this guy tries to do, he will, within some range, allowed by his vision, say, within the circle, he can check at the behavior of the other animals, these other arrows, the green arrows that you see here, and say, okay, let's move more or less like they move. Make the average of this, you know, not precise average, of course, or the speed of, their, of its neighbors, and tries to move in that direction. It has to go with them. So this very simple mechanism, this very simple idea of imitation between you know, a small number of animals, even if, of course, there are thousands of, uh, uh, in this case, social animals or birds in the, in the same flock, can explain, so, from starting from the microscopic level, this very nice order of motion that you see. And to see this, then, I had to go to my small movie here. So this could be a good setup. What were arrows before now are triangles. These are the birds that you've seen before. Again, no feathers, nothing or nothing really complicated, just the direction, position and direction of uh, motion. And if you apply this mechanism of imitation that you've seen before, in which each bird is just following its neighbors, at the end you see how the flock can be generated. Similar models, very simple models, which neglect basically all features except what really counts in this case, so this imitation process and basically the speed of the animals, can be applied to model panic situations, like the one you've seen before in the stadium or in the, in the pilgrimage of the Mecca or the Kaaba stone. And they led to major successes in the engineering of safety measures on big buildings in case there is a fire or something like this. Now they're asking these people to suggest to engineers how to, what is the best thing, you know, the best strategy to empty a room in the quickest possible time to reduce the casualties and the number, the risk of having victims there. So that's all. Of course, it can go forever. There is no indication to stop this animation. I had to do it by force. So, and uh, I will conclude by saying that uh, large-scale social dynamics can be understood with the concepts and methods of statistical physics. It's certainly the case for collective motion. But we don't want to stop in collective motion. Those were the end of the 80s, the 90s. We want to go beyond that, to things which are more tricky, things like explaining the formation of opinion, how people create consensus, again, in large population, like during elections electoral campaigns, how language evolves, how epidemic spreads. This is a very connected world right now. You know, something which happens here can have consequences in Indonesia or in Australia or in South America. Or how web user behaves, or how popularity, how some item can become popular suddenly just because a bunch of people try, you know, find it suddenly attractive. 
So this is what we want to do, and uh, we have good reasons so far to believe that this is uh, possible. And with that, I thank you.